Guess what, kitties? Oh, I got a one. Yeah! Daddy got a new PC to take the load off this piece of crap ThinkPad that's falling apart just over a year. It's awful. But, oh, there's all the good stuff. So let's dive in. First up, the Brains of the Beast. AMD Ryzen 7 2700X. 8 core, 16 threads. 3.7 cruising speed, 4.3 super boost speed. This is the most powerful chip the AMD sells short of their Threadripper series, which start at 16 cores, I think. And I just don't need that kind of power. I'm going to be doing video editing, software development, uh, and uh, 3D CAD with uh, Fusion 360. And those are the three things. They need a lot of memory. Let's just get this guy because we like the good stuff. Paired up with that, 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2666, the magic stuff. That uh, really helps the video editor and Fusion 360 stretch its legs without having tons of problems. Are we still in the world of spinning magnetic hard disk technology? I got a button. No! We are doing the M.2, 250 gigabytes of SSD goodness, Western Digital Black built uh, server quality. Uh, plug this guy into the motherboard, it's about as big as your thumb. No hard disks. I don't need a ton of storage because I've got everything on the network. I've got something like uh, 8 terabytes of RAID 5 storage over there. So everything I do runs over the network. The motherboard is from Asus. The company that I bought this from in the mall, they actually had three different boards that uses this uh, 450 chipset. And I just, uh, based on price and company name and the descriptions on the back, I went with this guy. Can pretty much trust the top tier Taiwanese board vendors. Next up is the graphics card. This Ryzen chip does not have an onboard GPU. So I went with this guy. It's a Radeon uh, 570 series, which is not quite top of the line, but again, I just need something that works nicely with a little bit of 3D acceleration for fusion. I'm not going to be blowing up bad guys, and uh, so I don't need some super duper gamer system. And the, uh, the Radeon pairs with this quite nicely. And it also has a feature from AMD called FastSync, I think it's called, that when you pair it up with your monitor, it gives you a better... Uh, fast motion. So when I'm uh, rotating one of my models in 3D, this card and the monitor pair together to give me the best look. And last up, dun, 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 it's Windows. As much as I've always hated Microsoft, all of my tools run on Windows. It's the engine that makes it work. And I paid full price for Windows Home because I want the peace of mind of real updates for performance and security. And I live in Southeast Asia. I could do a really dodgy thing with Windows on this box, but I figured I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to play by the rules and have a legit machine that I can depend on. Then I have a, a very compact case over here and a 650 watt power supply. Uh, the screen was ordered today. It will be here in a few days. Okay, here we go. Let's start putting this puppy together. And one thing I noticed over here that I didn't realize before is that there's an SD card slot built into the side of the front panel. That's really super handy for me because my 3D printer right here uses 
a big SD card to transfer the G code over to make a print. So if I can just copy it on, I don't want to break anything yet, but if I can just copy onto the card with the side of the machine and pop it into the printer, that's awesome. All right, first step, power supply. And inside the case, here's the header for card reader, focus, you card reader, along with all the other standard cables. This one is new to me. This one's labeled USB 3.0 with a specialized header and a really nicely molded connector. So let's tuck all this out of the way and put in the power supply. Okay, power supply is in and the first of probably many rants. This power supply has this massive tangle of wires coming out of it, some of which I'm not going to use. Like this one is for SATA hard disks power. This one is for SATA hard disk power. This one is for SATA hard disk power. And that just leaves the three motherboard power supply cables. I've seen other power supplies that are modular and you can, there, there's a bank of connectors here and you can disconnect certain cables that you're not going to be using. But now I'm trapped with this massive unused cable here. I'll probably have to zip tie them up and stick them down inside somewhere and get them out of the way because these are the only three that I'm actually going to be using. Okay, next rant, putting the motherboard in. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mounting holes to lay the board into the case. Now let's have a look and see what the case people gave me. One, two, three, four, five, six standoffs. Six and only six of these very important pieces of cheap ass metal and I can't put one in here and one in here for the motherboard and it's kind of important because this hole right here and this hole they're supporting having all of these connectors pushed into place across the bottom of the board so that means I mean, this hole is critical. This one may have enough cantilever from here. So I can maybe use this standoff here and move it to here. But this is not cool. Give the people more than enough standoffs. This is ridiculous. CPU is in. There, I have to say, there's not a super obvious pin one orientation but the f you know there's there's a small triangle of pins in each corner that doesn't uh, uh, that's cut out and I rotated around all four ways and I found the one that let it just drop right in the hole and of course the all-important front panel snicker will go somewhere on here we'll put that on later next up is the fan and this thing is a beast it's bigger than my hand and it actually came in the box with the processor. So it's it's actually exactly matched. Comes with a, a pad of heat transfer and the, the fan header. But the funny thing is, given this day of gamers and flashing lights, there's actually LEDs built into this thing, which are driven by these two cables, I assume. No instructions in the box as to how to make this work, and I don't care about LEDs, so let's move on. Okay, fan is in, nice and sturdy with this clip action. And the fan header is plugged into CPU underscore fan that actually does have an RGB header on the motherboard for plugging into the, the fan to make the blinking lights, but I'll see if I can live without that. Memory sticks are in. Interestingly, you can see there's four slots and they're in pairs. This is A1, A2, B1, B2. And the manual actually says they suggest for a single memory card, you put it in A2, 
for double cards it's A2 and B2 and then for four cards you fill them all up. Why do you number it two if it's the preferred plug slot? Anyway. Okay, so for something that should have been very easy, you stick it in the slot and you screw it down, it's actually a little more complicated. This connector is quite high off the motherboard, so when I first plugged the board in and pushed it down, it was actually pushing the board down below parallel. Then I realized that there was actually in the package not only this screw, but a little spacer similar to the ones that I screwed into the motherboard earlier. So I put the spacer in the hole in the motherboard, put the card in, and then screwed this little screw into the spacer, and that's perfect. And boy, do you need a tiny screwdriver. This is the smallest bit that I have to fit that tiny, tiny, tiny screw hole. The interesting thing, coming from back in the days of the IBM PC, which had about eight long expansion card slots in it. Computers these days generally have one big one for graphics cards and then a couple of little ones for other things. Um, it's predominantly because there's so much capability built into the motherboard now, you don't need a tremendous amount of expansion space. You've got Ethernet, You've got all the plugs, the USBs, the keyboard and the mouse, everything plugs in. This motherboard does not have built-in Wi-Fi, which I thought was a little weird, but you can use one of the, the little Wi-Fi dongles to give you Wi-Fi to your, uh, your network or even your keyboard and your mouse, which is what this guy does. So here's the graphics card. It's a bit of a beast. It's got a massive cooling capability and two fans. It's got the single PCI bus with this little protective slip that goes on. And out the back we've got HDMI, display port, and the DVI plug which is something that the guy who invented that deserves the worst part of hell because there are so many slightly, slightly, slightly incompatible versions of this plug it's crazy so HDMI display port I think the screen I've ordered works better in display port than it does in HDMI but we'll find that out soon so the uh, the card itself is based on the Radeon RX 570 graphics processor which is good it's kind of the the better version of the previous generation of boards I'm not going to be gaming on this thing. I don't need to be fragging people at 120 frames per second, but I do need decent 3D graphics for my modeling. Um, and this is basically the card that the shop had. Um, and it'll do the job, so I'm happy. And it has 8 gigabytes of video memory, which... Uh, will give the, the programs a lot of room they need to manipulate the graphics. I also have to say the price on it was actually pretty reasonable. Partly, or mostly, because of the collapse of Bitcoin. When Bitcoin went from a high of $20,000 a coin down to whatever it is now, um, the Bitcoin miners gave up buying graphics cards by the hundreds and having farms of machines that did nothing but run Bitcoin mining software on these boards, much to the annoyance of gamers and people who just wanted a decent graphics card. Now that that industry has collapsed, we now have reasonably priced graphics cards again and we can actually do our thing. The next bit of madness is I, I put the graphics card in and went to screw the hole in it didn't go in the hole. These four holes, they come punched, as you can maybe see, but they're not threaded. You have to drive a screw in and make your own threads. Unfortunately, the screws they give you are not good enough to self-thread through this cheap-ass steel. But there is a protective plastic bracket that goes over here for some reason. 
that's held on by this screw that does have a cutting thread on it if you can see that at all so I use that to cut threads for these two screws that will hold the graphics card in come on guys this is just lazy and then instead of supplying blanks that can be screwed back into place they're simply you, you break them off and then you're left with this cheap piece of metal that's not good for anything next up come all the uh, connectors for the devices in the chassis to, to the motherboard luckily the motherboard manual has quite a good section on how all these connectors work so I just got to do them all one by one well I should have known better the vast majority of these cables connect to all of those header pins along the bottom so out comes a graphics card okay all of the chassis cables are plugged in power cables are in everything zip tied this is the power cable to go to the graphics card so I'm holding that off this is the cable for the SD card reader that I was so looking forward to and there's nothing to plug it in on the motherboard it just doesn't have that function so I'll either have to scrap that or maybe get a little PCI card that knows how to plug into that anyway what I wanted to do at this point is a smoke test before I plug in the graphics card I want to power this thing on and just see lights blink and fans spin so it's a multi-stage process first I'll provide power from the wall then I turn on the power supply oh I have there's a little LED there and then the on off button and the on off button does nothing okay secondary power connector is plugged into the graphics card and the thing everything powers up and in fact there's a little white LED underneath that the power connector I don't know what that signifies because it doesn't say anything but everything is plugged in and we're powered up now all I have to do is plug something into my HDMI which will be my big ass TV okay the computer is just barely hooked up to the TV I'm gonna push the reset button and come over here cross your fingers ha we have motherboard okay the the USB wireless keyboard is working because it's spazzing out when I hit the enter key trying to look for a boot drive so here's the Windows boot key I'll stick that in and hit the reset button okay I booted up into the BIOS oh wow there's a lot of information in here let's confirm Ryzen 7 2700 3.7 megahertz, 3.7 gigahertz, 16 gigs of RAM. That's awesome. There's our two sticks. CPU fan is spinning. The chassis fan is spinning. And under SATA, I don't have any SATA drives plugged, but it's, it's also not recognizing my M.2 drive because that actually runs on one of the SATA channels. But over here, it says this is my Western Digital 250 gigabyte M.2 drive so it's reading it and it recognizes it and this is the Windows install USB so somehow I gotta get it to boot off here and install onto there and it says choose one and drag so if I drag my Windows boot stick to the top it should boot now Windows set up 64 bit. Focus, you fuck. Haha. <clears throat> -ha. Okay, I'll save you the pain of a Windows install and I'll come back to you in a minute.
Okay, everything's installed. I even got um, RGB LEDs going, even though I didn't hook up the little cables. Oh, screw them. Everything's good, and I got uh, most of my software installed, and I ran this Passmark benchmark. Okay, so the Passmark, it runs a bunch of separate benchmarks and then pulls them all together into this thing called the Passmark. And I'm sitting at 98th percentile in the world, which is pretty cool. My CPU is 99th percentile in the world. My 2D graphics are only 93rd percentile. My 3D graphics are only 89th percentile, which doesn't surprise me. It's, it's not the latest and greatest card, but it sure does the job. Memory is 69th percentile. Uh, and my M2 disk is 99th percentile. And that somehow calculates to give me 98th percentile in the world, which makes me happy. So I can clean up and zip tie that and box it up and get some longer cables and then wait for the screen to come in and then I'm totally up and running. Oh! I got a Look what the free shipping fairy just brought. Ultimate curve, incredible performance. All right, let's rip into her. It's 34 inches of quantum dot goodness. Now I got to figure out how it's going to fit on my desk. First out of the box are the cables, little power supply box, and an adapter. Uh, HDMI and display port to display port which is good because I've got this connector in the back of the uh, 570 graphics card and it claims to handle higher resolutions better than HDMI I've never used display port before so that'll be fun this is um, some kind of crazy super speed USB connector. That's crazy. It's got two separate actual connectors built into the connector. And this is a display port to mini display port adapter, which I don't think I need to use. And there she is with all the curves. It's funny that they have to have such a, a big box that's got to be over a foot tall to pack in the monitor because it's got uh, the base sticks out and it's got the curve so there's actually a lot of air in the box just to get the packaging right for the monitor flipping her onto her front side you can see there's a little toggle switch here this is power you reach around and you push the button to get power and this also drives the on-screen menu system once it's powered up. Over here under the cable connector we have power in, two HDMI's, display port, and super speed USB which has an internal hub so you can plug two USB devices in here, framing, uh, and then there's a service jack. Be interesting to hack into that. And this just to give you the exact model number. C34F791WQ. Okay, after a lot of moving stuff around and a lot of spring cleaning, let's go put her on the desk. Okay, I just had the scare of my life. The monitor wouldn't turn on. So I checked the power plug, and it is putting out 19 volts as specified, but you can see that even with the slightest tug, the connector falls right out. This is just purely bad design. First, the connector only seats itself about that much. From there, let me get in closer. From there to there is fully seated for the connector. And there's just nothing holding it in place. So I'm going to 
tape this into place, this is a bad design. And it, it's going to fall down with gravity. 9.8 meters per second squared, people. What are you thinking? Make a locking barrel connector. Make a deeper connector. Put a little cable latch or something inside. Version 2. Okay, we are powered up. And you can see that it takes up a tremendous amount of space, but it's actually, let me get my arm back, it's actually really easy to slide up and down on the mounting post and then to tilt, well, two hands would be better, but the tilting this way and the sliding up and down feels very solid and the base is incredibly heavy. Uh, it takes a lot to try and make this move away from where it's sitting. And if we look at the menu system, the button right here, once it's powered up, you push in. That will take you to menu. That takes you to picture in picture. That takes you to your sources, HDMI 1, HDMI 2, and display port, and then down powers off. The menu has picture, Brightness, contrast, sharpness, color, picture in picture mode, on screen display, how this behaves right here. There's the free sync that I was looking for to work with my card. It actually has quite an extensive speaker system built into the bottom and a headphone jack on the back, but it doesn't have a microphone. So I'm going to need to go and buy a microphone so when I do my screen recordings. What else have we got? Oh, went away. Menu. Focus. Eco saving timer. PC or audio video mode. Display port version 1.2. And uh, this is very nice. I love it when it tells you exactly what it's being driven with. So Windows booted up at 640 by 480. And so we can go and change that to its native resolution. You can see Windows is suggesting 3440 by 1440, which is the native LCD panel resolution. And keep changes. Wow, so many pixels. So many pixels to work with. It looks like, I don't know if Windows is doing this, but it looks a little darker in this corner, brighter in the center, and a little darker along the edge. It might just be me. There's my full screen desktop. Oh, this is beautiful. Here's a native 4K demonstration video of downtown Tokyo looks beautiful even though we're reducing the resolution this way it's still rock solid and bright and gorgeous oh and I just got the audio to work I can definitely live with that it's interesting to see which websites are designed such that they can make use of this incredible horizontal resolution as Gmail can Google Contacts, Google Calendar, Monday through Sunday, beautiful. Slashdot is a technical news website, side to side, beautiful. Facebook, terrible. Even using Facebook Purity to completely remove everything on the left side, it still leaves this massive empty space. Uh, IMDB is the worst. Look at this. It's got some kind of fixed width that it refuses to resize to. Now, I could zoom in like this to get it to go side to side, but then it's really difficult to, uh, to read because everything is far, far too big. Even Twitter, they've got a, I'll give you a huge background. And then everything is in this tiny little column in the center. Come on, guys. This is ridiculous. 
Let's check out a few of my other apps. This is Android Studio, which I use to build the Android app that I use for my digital dashboard on the scooter. You can see it's very smart. It runs side to side, top to bottom. This pane is my file tree. This is my working code, and I've actually made the font a little bigger here because I've got the space. And then this is um, uh, properties window will pop up here when I need that. Down here is the build window. And building the entire app took 24 seconds, which is much faster than the old laptop. Here's the Arduino editor, which is a very primitive code editing system. All you need is code here and your build and uh, debug down here. But it just popped up and told me that I had some updates available. But you can see, instead of letting me scroll up and down to see them, it's this tiny little thing here that I can't do anything with. Normally, it's about this big and has a box of text and it says, yeah, do you want to update it or not? Let me change resolution and see if it fixes the problem. Yes, here we are. I set it to 1920 by 1280, I think, and it tells me that I've got one library that's updatable, and yes, go ahead and update it. So, that's a bug for the Arduino guys. And here we have Atmel Start. This is the tool that I'm using to write the firmware for this circuit board. This is the main screen where you configure all of your devices and drivers. Then you specifically change the parameters as to how something works. And it's so great to have so many pixels on the screen for this. Then over here, you write your code. And over here, you have your file tree. And then down here at the bottom, you have, we're actually in debug mode right now, and I'm single stepping through the code. And it's great to be able to see so much of your code as you're looking at your debug variables and the contents of flash memory over here. So, Atmel Studio is doing this right. This is PicoScope, the tool to work with my USB oscilloscope that is not doing anything very interesting right now, but it sure does have the space on the screen for both your channel A and B inputs. And once I get the code working, it will decode the CAN bus serial data and show me my packets down here. And this has just got all the space in the world for a beautiful oscilloscope view. And this is where I'm really looking for some good uh, screen real estate use is Fusion 360. Over here we have my projects and my parts and over here is the work area. You can see I can have both of them up at the same time and still have a tremendous amount of space and I can go over here and I have to put this down so I can push the control key and we can spin around in 3D and it's just fast, so fast and so beautiful. This was my first 3D project working along with one of their tutorials. Let me bring up something else. This is the DC to DC uh, holder that goes into the front of the motorbike. And that's just swirling around in space beautifully. I can select anything. The rendering is just great. All the uh, lighting and the shading and the textures and the curves are smooth. Here's my 60 cell 21700 battery holder bracket. Just a ton of space on the screen. And if I come down here, just beautiful. This is nuts how fast and gorgeous this is. Here's my dual color power bus bar bracket holder. 
red on one side for positive, black on the other side for negative, and that brass bar slips right in there beautifully. Okay, we're now in Simplify 3D that prepares the prints, the, the 3D designs for printing on the printer. So I'm going to load in one of the models. Here's one that somebody built of a Tesla Model S, which is rather large, too big to fit on the printer. Okay, scaled to 40%. Now let's prepare to print, and this is where it usually takes a long time. This is a very, very complicated model, and it used to take minutes to do this on my old machine. And here we are. It's already done, and it'll preview the printing layer by layer. And this build is going to take 12 hours and 14 minutes. So it helps to have the screen real estate and the CPU grunt to be able to actually uh, render this as quickly as it has. This is another major one. I was looking for improvement. Design Spark PCB layout, and you can see how much space I've got on the sides. But I've got my entire schematic is viewable and readable in one page without having to scroll around and zoom in and zoom out all the time. And if we jump over to the PC board layout, the whole board is on here, and everything is big enough that I can click on it and actually work on the whole board at once without zooming in although I could zoom in say one level wow that gets really big if, if I zoom in at all zoom in one yeah that's huge and I can pan around and get to any pin that I need to it's going to be a lot of work here around the USB and around the microcontroller so that works out beautifully. And last but not least is my video editor that I use. It's called VSDC. The main viewing window here and the scene window is over here. And then the different layers in the scene are over here. Right now I've just got a video and one text overlay, as you can see. Then if I click over here, you've got all the properties windows and I can actually afford to make that a little bigger now it makes me happy with the power of the CPU in this for the video editor to render the output video is extremely fast uh, before on the laptop I was getting about 15 frames per second now on this one uh, I was getting about 80 to 85 frames per second on a test video that I tried and this number will slowly creep up over time. That means my time to edit, render, fix it, render, fix it, render, fix it to the point where I'm happy goes from watching a TV show while it waited to just you know, getting up and getting a Diet Coke and coming back and it's done. So that's fantastic. So that about wraps it up. I'm super happy with this system and its speed and especially the monitor really gives me the pixels to spread out and do what I need to do. As you stare out on my beach, I would ask you to subscribe to my channel and click like on this video so YouTube thinks I'm worthy again and I have so many people on my channel that they'll give me 10 cents a day in ad revenue. So I thank you for that.